This is Louis the Fourteenth. This is Pandu Nayak. Hi. This is Paris. Paris Hilton. Paris. This is Paris Hilton. How many voices do I have? <laughs> well, that's pretty good. That was your real voice. This is Paris Hilton. <laughs> One, two, three, that's hot. This is Paris Hilton. No, this is. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is. This is Paris Hilton. <laughs> Paris f***ing Hilton. <laughs> this is Paris f***ing Hilton! of a book, except 10 trillion times longer. Lasagna appears on 59 million of those pages. When you search for lasagna, the software puts these pages in order, with what it hopes are the most useful at the top and less useful at the bottom. How many people live in the capital? What can they teach us about music, culture, astronomy? People who had access to cave walls, clay tablets, oracles, scrolls, books, the printing press, libraries, semaphore towers, telegraphs, the radio, the television, the Betamax tape. One torn encyclopedia that I think my grandfather had given my mum. So it was really out of date. And the short-lived French national internet system called Minitel. Pour l'annuaire des services Minitel. Which? brings us to today. So, what is our mission? So, how is Google different? Basically, we want to organize the world's information and make it usually, uh, universally accessible and useful. Act now! We will be with you shortly. A whiter, brighter smile. The kind of websites that when you end up on them, you hit the back button as quickly as possible. Because they're sh because they're spam, not the delicious kind. Some scientists even say it's an impossible mystery to solve, given the brain's complexity. But others are determined to prove that the brain is the key to unlocking the secrets of the soul. For Dr. Owen, the brain is the key to solving the mystery of who we are. He's looking for evidence of consciousness in people who show no signs of consciousness at all.
And then, as if by destiny, the stars would align once more to pave the way to a groundbreaking discovery. Cows. This marked the start of one of the best documented cases of possible reincarnation in history. As Christians, they never believed in reincarnation, but they began to piece together an amazing story. The first clue came from the terrifying nonstop nightmares that James began having at the age of two. He was saying, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. Airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. And then he sat up and he goes, mama, the little man's going like this. And he laid down and he goes, and he did the same thing he did in his dream. He's kicking his feet up and he goes, little man's going like this. Ooh, 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 can't get out, can't get out. And he, I sat him back up and I said, who's the little man? And he goes, me. I never heard the word before. And I went down the hall and uh, got onto the computer and Googled it. And down around hit 300. All there was this thing, uh, the Toma Bay CVE-62. Clicked on it, and up comes this history of a World War II aircraft carrier. And so that was, was the beginning of what the heck is going on here. standing there <laughs> staring at this picture of this little, it was like an aerial photo of this little aircraft carrier in the water and we just stood there staring wow. at it for a long time. I had no answers. Uh, you know, how could he know this? How could he know a person? How could he know a ship? And what did all this mean? So that was where I really just said, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know what I'm going to find, but I'm not going to stop looking until I get as many answers as I can get. Then James started drawing. That was one of my mission things. The mission thing, you remember that? Yeah. Th that's one of my favorite ones. It's the same thing, over and over. Like a movie compressed all into one frame. An air battle. Flack. A plane on fire. And his signature, James III. So one day I was in the kitchen, I was washing dishes, James had breakfast, and, and he had an airplane, he was just flying around like this, and he goes, Mama, before I was born, I was a pilot, and my airplane got shot in the engine and crashed in the water, and that's how I died. You won't believe this, there's only one guy from the Toma Bay who was killed during the ba battle for Iwo Jima, and his name was, it was James M. Houston, Jr. And I said, wait, that would make our James, James III. Yeah. I was so excited. I'm like, that's it. I'm like, that's him. It's, J it's James M. Houston. His name is James. It's James III. James Houston, Jr. Since he was two, James showed an unusual fascination for military air shows and an uncanny familiarity with vintage aircraft. His parents cautiously made contact with James Houston's only surviving relative, his sister, Anne. At first, she didn't know what to think about the little boy who claimed to be her brother reincarnated. But then, James asked her for a painting that only one person other than her knew existed. She sent this January 16th, 2006, says, Dear James, I do hope that this is the picture you asked for. I am sorry to be so long sending it to you. These past few weeks have been very busy and hectic. I hope you like it. And there were other, more chilling connections. James had three G.I. Joes he named Billy, Walter, and Leon. Bruce goes, how come you named your G.I. Joes Billy, Walter, and Leon? And he goes, because that's who met me when I got to heaven. <laughs> Billy Peeler, Walter Devlin, and Leon Connor were all in the same squadron as James Houston. And he looked at the dates of death, and they all died before James Houston died. They all flew with him. What happened next was uncanny. So we're cleaning up the yard. He's playing in the leaves. I said, I just love you to bits. And he goes, well, he said, I knew you'd be a good daddy when I picked you. And I said, what? And he said, well, when I found you and mommy, I knew you would be good parents. My <clears> head was shrinking to the size of a raisin, you know, my brain. I said, what do you mean when you found us? He said, well, I found you and mommy. Uh, I found you and mommy in Hawaii. James told his father that he saw them in a pink hotel, which is where the Leiningers were staying when they decided to have James. Bruce and Andrea were cautious about asking doctors and psychiatrists for help, 
they decided to find their own solution to James's ordeal. And their solution was to go to Japan, to the very expansive ocean where the pilot, James Houston Jr., died. Thou who art the pilot of the souls of men. The boat was right above where the, you know, the wreckage of the plane was. And Bruce did this beautiful memorial service. And so I thought that was a perfect moment for me to just say, you know, I, I sat down with them and I said, you know, Jim Houston has been a part of your life for as long as we can remember. And he's always going to be an important part of, of who you are. But you have a life to live as James Lininger. And it's time for you to say goodbye and to Jim Houston. And he just started the ball. Started bawling. And he cried for about 20 minutes. Yeah, he had everyone on the boat. It was the saddest the thing I ever seen. Yeah, he had everyone on the boat. Crying. It's time for us to say goodbye. To Houston. Goodbye, James and Houston. Good job. such a brave soul, such a brave soul and spirit. The next picture that James Leininger drew was one of peace. The nightmares stopped. The memories started to fade. I don't want him to remember anything about his past life. He has a life, you know, and I don't want him to be bogged down or confused or... Well, he's our son, you know, he's not, he's not Jim Houston got a life to live. Today, James Leininger can remember nothing specific about the soul that used to torment him. At 12, he is an ordinary boy whose bedroom says something about who he is and who he believes he once was. The spirit that I used to have when I was four, five, six has gone away. I'm just James now. It's not I still have James Houston in me, I think, but it's not so much the bad history. It's more of the peaceful history of his life. Instead of the crashing of the plane, his death. I don't really think about my story so much. I just don't really talk about it. Uh, so the issue is, you know, how does it happen? I don't know. Why it happens, we can sit here and guess about it, but the fact is that it does happen. And so people should be, should listen closer, should not just give it up because it's a two-year-old saying something that might sound meaningless to you. Um, from the point of view of the people that we've spoken to that are attempting to do something scientific with it, I can understand rational thinking. I'm a pretty rational guy. This is not something rational. <laughs> and I had a struggle with that spiritually, but I came to the conclusion that it's, I now have a three-dimensional belief system instead of two-dimensional. Dr. Jim Tucker has examined James Leininger. Tucker has developed what he calls a strength of case scale for reincarnation, and he gives James a near perfect score. Some are intrigued, many are perplexed, um, some are upset. After four decades and 2,500 cases, the researchers at the University of Virginia have come to a startling conclusion. Reincarnation is real. My immediate reaction was intense terror. I was terrified, I was frightened. The plane was crashing, I was going to die. And what happened was I had this feeling like my fear was being pushed out and this calm and peace was descending upon me. And I entered sort of a paranormal, peaceful state. The plane crashed into an icy lake in a wilderness area, hundreds of miles from the nearest town. Then what happened is my near-death experience deepened. Suddenly, as I was swimming to shore and starting to freeze, I heard this noise, and it was like 
my consciousness got whisked out of my body and I was no longer in my body that was swimming to shore, suddenly I was like 20 or 30 feet above my body looking down. And it was me still trying to swim to shore. Miraculously, a helicopter pilot hearing of a downed plane came to her rescue. And it was in that hot water that my consciousness re-entered my body. Very good. You have done well. And so on and off you go, and you're on to the, uh, the kind of the runaway loop that some people have called the technological singularity. The notion that something so big and so important could be hidden for so long, um, I think, uh, captured people's imagination. Out of sight, out of mind, no more. Of course, not everything that's undetected is so obviously obscured. And one remarkable discovery this year offers clues about how some prehistoric creatures could hide in plain sight. In northern Alberta, Canada, it was a year that saw long-held beliefs challenged by newly found wonders. We knew it was good, but we didn't know how good it was. You know, those questions start to get people hung up and then they start to be kind of funny and silly. But the yearning itself is real and powerful. So it's, it's a conundrum, like all of these things. Those yearnings require that consciousness be something separate from the brain, that it is something not material, but magical. I haven't gone to the place where I believe it was true. And yet it felt true to me. It felt real to me. And I am very sympathetic with those feelings that people have, you know. My personal opinion is that Americans like reincarnation because, comparatively speaking, life here is good. And it's one thing to want heaven.
Dr. Paul DeBell is a psychiatrist who specializes in what's called past life regression. Using hypnotism, he's taken countless patients on a voyage back in time to souls their bodies have forgotten. When nobody thought that the mind could be understood, nobody thought dreams could be understood, nobody thought Ill mental illness could be understood because it was too complex. Dr. Duncan McDougall conducted a ghoulish experiment he watched six people die. After 10 seconds without oxygen, the brain starts to die. After five minutes, it's completely gone. But what happens to consciousness in that precious five minutes? New research suggests that consciousness might actually leave the brain. I just think like there's something cool about um, saying like, hey, how did you feel during this time? Do you remember? There we go. There is evidence that consciousness at times can exist separately from a functioning brain. If you look at the, the best cases, uh, they provide evidence that at times there can be this carryover of memories and emotions that seem carried over from one life and, and continue on in another. Which certainly suggests that there is a part of us, a, a consciousness part that may be able to continue on after the brain dies, which would indicate that, that the brain may not be the creator of at least part of our consciousness, but more as sort of a portal that the consciousness flows through, that there may be this other piece of existence separate from the physical world, that there's this consciousness piece, again, that, that may be independent of the physical world and, and the physical brains that it seems to come through. What is the soul? Where is it? Can you measure it? Touch it? Recreate it? Well, what is the soul just on itself? I mean, how do we envisage the soul without the body? It's very, very difficult. The Greeks believed in reincarnation, that the soul can move on to a new body. As Christianity conquered the world, the Greek idea of body and soul being separate things was eclipsed by the evolving Christian notion that body and soul are part of the same whole. Is there something that survives the body? Well, consciousness is mysterious, and I believe when we create non-biological systems that have that same kind of behavior and the same complexity and richness of emotional intelligence, which is also a form of intelligence, uh, they will be conscious as well. If you ask somebody, 
Do you believe you have an immortal soul? Or do you believe you have a soul? Um, I think that um, people would be exposing what are their most um, heartfelt hopes, their worst fears. Um, and um, so I think it's much easier for us to focus on what we can apprehend, our intelligence, how smart are we, IQs. You know, is that a measure of the soul? Um, it certainly is a measure of the reasoning faculty, the intellect. Um, so it doesn't have anything to do with the imagination. Um, so it's a very limited view of what the soul is and also a very temporal view. view. I don't think consciousness is some supernatural soul that is not measurable scientifically, that's somehow associated uh, with our natural brain. I also don't think there's a mystical world beyond what we can measure. If something actually exists, uh, then it's part of uh, the real world and ultimately we should be able to detect it.
our starting point is our own uh, moon. We've seen men walk on the moon, and it's pretty big. Einstein's theory of general relativity makes possible one of the strangest objects ever imagined by physicists. If you could create a large enough distortion in space-time, by placing enough mass in a small enough space, you could create a region of space-time so strongly curved that nothing, not even light, could escape it. And since nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, anything that entered this region of space-time would be trapped there until quantum mechanical effects allowed it to escape. Black holes can come in any size and have any mass. All that is required is that enough mass can be concentrated to the point where it collapses under its own gravity. Stellar mass black holes are formed when stars 20 or more times the size of our own sun finally run out of fuel in their cores. They rapidly cool and collapse, and a shockwave from the collapse blows the outer layers of the stars to bits in a colossal explosion called a supernova. But the small, dense core of the star can remain bound together by the force of gravity. As it continues to collapse inward under its own weight, the atomic particles of the core are smashed together until all that is left is a black hole. In its center lies the singularity, the mass of the entire star crushed into a single point in space. Surrounding that is an invisible shell called the event horizon. This is the cosmic point of no return. Once inside the event horizon, nothing, not even light, can escape except through quantum mechanical processes. Supermassive black holes may contain billions of times the mass of our sun. These monsters lie at the center of every large galaxy. Micro black holes have tiny masses at which the effects of quantum mechanics are very important. Black holes of this type have been proposed to have formed during the Big Bang and would quickly evaporate due to said quantum mechanical effects. At the end of their life, it is believed that they would emit a sudden burst of energetic particles, but no such burst had been detected as of 2008. We can never see into or directly know about what happens inside the event horizon of a black hole. In effect, any object that crosses this imaginary 